two of our walk through the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism, uh, Weber's great book on the uh, religious origins of, um, of modern capitalism. Last time was Weber's project and compared what he's doing uh, to um, some of the work that others have, have done on Judaism as sort of the great break in history that launched us down the road towards um, ascetic Protestantism and ultimately uh, the spirit of capitalism. What we did last time is we essentially argued that all cultures, and maybe we could even say non-Judaic cultures, um, uh, emphasized this worldly mundane gods, the imminent God present in the world that you can pray to and sacrifice to, right? Uh, the, the gods that are involved in the management of human life. And again, words are real here. And just, just, uh, just, just know that we're, we're, what we're talking about is the structure of belief, the structure of religious, um, uh, um, um, the, of the religious imagination. So, um, you, you, we're not really advocating here for belief that the gods are real. They're real because people treat them as real. They're real because they are sociologically real. They're real because the gods are a collective representation of a group of people. So, so they're real in that sense, right? So at any rate, pre Judaic cultures, again, that this is the mundane god of mysticism, magic, and sacrifice. We argued that Judaism in history negated that kind of God and then generated the Yahweh, right? The, the, the otherworldly, supramundane God, the God that didn't want sacrifice, the God that didn't have magic, that was actually really hostile to magic, and that demanded obedience and, 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 and the following of one uh, of God's will. So the ascetic path uh, to salvation. Um, and then we argued that uh, Western Christendom, most other uh, uh, world religions, uh, negated this. It didn't last. I mean, it kept going as a Jew. But Western Christendom, it was kind of, and reinstalled a this God of sacrifice, mysticism, magic, and traditions, the God of medieval, uh, Christian, you know, Western Christendom. The Protestant Reformation, Weber is going to claim, negates this. So tradition was the great barrier blocking the, uh, you know, both psychologically and socially blocking the move into capitalism, and that uh, Protestant Christianity negates and negates the, um, the this worldly God uh, by strongly asserting an otherworldly, super mundane God again, the God uh, of the Calvinists uh, to a degree, the God of of. Um, of some of the pietists. I mean, not really super mundane, but it has the same kind of feeling. But at any rate, you get ascetic Protestantism, okay? And so you get this negation we wind up here. And then Weber is going to make the claim that uh, the spirit of capitalism essentially secularizes this ethic and that you wind up with the spirit of capitalism as an as ascetic uh, rational conduct of life devoid of religious content, right? And so you have money-making and profit-making, uh, you know, a symbolic scorekeeping, sacred end or a sacred duty of life, but it's, again, kind of disconnected from religion. And, uh, you know, we'll try to, I'll address this now and hopefully we can later. Again, you get this return of the repressed, right? So um, this is what winds up returning so that almost all religions, um, almost all of the uh, uh, Christian sects and Christian denominations, certainly the mainstream Christian denominations. Um, so in um, in our time, almost all religious organizations and and uh, churches are um, are are back to this of a this worldly uh, a mundane God. So religion becomes a kind of split off act. act split off activities separated from, you know, the uh, dominant uh, idea structure of everyday life. It's no longer a kind of theological framing of the capitalist order itself. And um, yeah, so you wind up with uh, uh, the spirit of capitalism as a secular uh, uh, worldview uh, built on the foundation of ascetic Protestantism. So this is sort of the historical story <laughs> that Weber is telling. So let's get into more detail about that. Okay. All right. Um, and kill this. Okay, so Weber. Um, so the introduction to the book is really the interest collected writings on the economic ethics of the world religions. Uh, and so 
The process ethic and the spirit of capitalism is part of this larger project that Weber engaged in over a pro, uh, it must have been 20 years. Um, his goal was to really try to understand the, the sort of causal role that ideas or consciousness have in, um, in history and especially in determining the structure of an economic a system as large and globally dominant as capitalism. So in some ways he's speaking to Marx and Marx is largely um, material, um, you know, that usually the, 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 the predominant way of framing Weber is that he's trying to add idealist or, or cultural um, or psychological or, or spiritual issues um, in as a causal explanation for the rise of capital. Um, I really don't think that he and Marx are actually doing things that different. I think that Marx is often misunderstood as being too materialistic. And I think that Weber is often misread as being too uh, focused upon, you know, religious ideas. As we talked about last time, that Weber's, you know, like in the general economic history, I mean, he really outlines about eight uh, presuppositions uh, to modern Western capitalism that have nothing whatever uh, to do um, with, or at least only one of them have anything to do uh, with religion as such, right? So, so, so anyway, but, but he is interested in the causal world that the Protestant ethic had in clearing the groundwork for the rise of the uh, rational uh, Western uh, capitalist spirit. Okay, so it's a very complex study. Um, he really views modern Western capitalism, uh, the capitalism that marched across the grow from, grow, globe beginning in 1650 forward, as a, a, as a world historical phenomenon that had no precedent. And so his question was, you know, why didn't other civilizations, China, India, ancient Judaism, or even medieval Catholicism, um, uh, act as a springboard into uh, uh, modern Western capitalism. In other words, why was it only the regions of Europe that had a Protestant Reformation? Um, at least, why did those regions seem to be the uh, locations from uh, that incubated and launched um, the Protestant ethic? Okay. All right. So, um, in the introduction uh, to the book, um, again, we're going to just kind of try to outline this. Um, Weber, again, believes that there's only been one modern Western capitalism. It's a world historical individual uh, without precedent, right? So sober bourgeois capitalism is an ideal type. That means it's a logically consistent, somewhat removed from reality, a disciplined construct um, that contains sort of the essential genetic features of, of bourgeois capitalism. Um, you know, any specific instantiation of sober bourgeois capitalism, say like, like, like Sweden versus, uh, uh, Belgian, you know, Belgium and say 1820 or something, right? Like, like these different locations are going to have a different flavor and none of these, uh, you know, specific particularizations of capital are going to have all of the features that, that Weber associates with sober bourgeois capitalism. But it provides us with a kind of ideal measuring stick against which we can compare any actually existing historical case and allows us to p compare cases to each other and so on. So, so Weber's sociology is always a kind of adjunct to the study of history. He views himself as someone who's developing uh, ideal type concepts and even ideal type theories that help um, you know, people who are interested in history make sense of the causal relations that led to us into the world in which uh, we live. Okay, so the ideal type construct uh, contains, page 1718, the definition, uh, modern Western capitalism or sober bourgeois capitalism, profit seeking, right? So profit becomes the sacred end. The ultimate end of the system is um, is profit seeking. In, in production of commodities, which we already know about from Marx, for everyday use, exchanged in a peaceful, sober market, uh, production facilities are rationally organized and managed with decisions made through calculation of potential profit through the striking of a balance in accounting. So rational, systematic calculation. He believes all of this is contingent upon formerly free labor that's organized in offices and factories in a kind of rational way. As we talked about last time, rationality, he believes, which is, the, again, the unconstrained selection of means to pursue an, uh, ends right? So that there's no sacred means. You can do whatever you need to, to get to an end. Uh, that, and, and that this leads to efficiency and, 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 and reason 
and you know logical consistency and so on and that 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 rationality is expressed throughout a bourgeois culture it's in science history law art music architecture literature universities bureaucracies and other things on page 16 okay so and um i just love this image from uh i think it was from a 1940s business ad um it sort of shows numbers uh laying siege to a castle and i sort of like this this is basically weber's argument so if you think of the castle as representing you know traditional economic ethics or something like you know the traditional world of a mundane god that can be uh, approached through sacrifice prayer um and mysticism which i think a medieval castle actually works for that right in other words medieval christianity um then you can see that sober bourgeois capitalism, which is all about these features, especially the striking of a balance, you know, the rule of numbers, the rule of calculation, that this ultimately uh, uh, lays waste to traditional society, negates it, right? So that in the end, Weber argues that the modern Western capitalism, once it begins, is able to essentially destroy almost any uh, traditional society that it comes into contact with. Okay. All right. So, so again, profit seeking through the production of commodities for everyday use exchanged in a peaceful, sober market, production facilities, rationally organized and managed. And again, this crucial thing about the decisions that are made um, through calculation of potential profit by striking a balance in accounting, right? Um, really, really important. So, so, you know, the entire system is not ritualistic. It, you're not ritually reproducing what came before. Um, instead, workers, managers, uh, uh, supervisors, uh, investors are essentially working in this symbolic realm, making calculations. Profit is simply a calculation, right? It's not an actual thing. It's a calculation. And so you're, you're really playing at play in the realm of the symbolic and you're reconstructing everyday life, the work, the life of workers, the, the bodies of workers, the way that things are made and produced, the economy, right? You're remaking the world, destroying the environment even, on the basis of calculations of something as wispy and intangible as profit. I was an auditor, I was an accountant, and I can tell you that um, profit is not a hard, fast, certain, sure thing. Profit is actually something that is based upon um, belief. Um, reported profit isn't anything that's actually uh, a, a solid. It's based upon all kinds of assumptions and 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 accrual accounts and depreciation uh, accounts and um, you know accounts that are set aside for uh, for receivables and for accounts payable and for you know delinquent accounts and so on. There's all kinds of adjustments that are made uh, that that determine what profit actually is. It's simply a set of assumptions. And that we, the idea that we actually, again, reconstruct the world and destroy the planet uh, based upon something as wispy and thin as the uh, calculation of profit always strikes me as something really worth pondering about. But anyway, it's also organized with formerly free labor, again, wage labor, salaried labor, not slaves, not serfs, and offices and factories. So there's Weber's modern Western capitalism. Okay. And again, it's really important that we pay close attention to accounting. So here's another image from a 1940s ad about, about getting lost in figures and needing to make calculations so that you can control a business and control an enterprise and make decisions about you know uh, investment and, and, and so on. Yeah, so there it is. Business stars without its daily supply of figures. This is all produced by the same advertising firm, you can tell. So just this idea that we're feeding business uh, uh, accounting figures, right? It's kind of an interesting thing. Anyway, so there's we're back to a heroic accountant that we couldn't seem to find last time. All right, and then here's other images of this too. So to modern Western cap, to Weber, modern Western cap depends upon money and again, calculations of money. And you have to have a money economy or you can't make calculations, right? So one of the reasons that modern Western capitalism is so efficient and can outperform any slave or serf system is that the uh, constant need to convert everything into the universal equivalent of money, putting a price on everything, makes it easier for, um, for maximization for decision making to take place, right? It's really hard to calculate unpaid household labor or unpaid slave labor. It's very difficult to surf labor, right? Corvée labor, hard to calculate it, but it's very easy to calculate free wage labor paid with, uh, with money. Okay, so on we go. Um, 
yeah, I think I'm going to wait with all of these other images. We'll just keep going. Okay, so chapter one. So in chapter one, Weber reviews and tries to sort of clear the field of existing scholarship that that is trying to explain the relationship between religious affiliation and social stratification. So I kind of don't like this chapter. I always kind of skip it when I'm teaching it, but we'll spend a little bit of time on it. And, and what Weber argues is that everywhere in Europe, wherever you have Protestant Christianity, not Catholicism, but Protestant Christianity, you get a higher level of capitalist development. Okay, so why would that be the case? All right, so he has like four myths that he reviews. Myth one, or at least explanation one, Protestants are rebels who sought freedom from religious and ethical authority. They hated the Pope, they hated priests, they rebelled, and uh, they then become entrepreneurial money-making rebels. He claims that that isn't quite accurate because the Protestants who fought free of the Pope and of bishops and of, uh, of, of priestly authority did so because they didn't think the Pope and the Catholic Church was religious enough. They were actually seeking an enhanced control of conduct rather than a release from the control of conduct. So most people who engaged in, say, especially the Calvinist reforms or the Pietist reforms, did so because they thought that religion should permeate every aspect of everyday life, right? And so they thought that the existing church was actually quite sinful, maybe even demonic, right? So they weren't rebels against authority. They actually sought to impose authority upon themselves that was greater than and stronger than uh, what had been in uh, the church. Okay, the second explanation, Protestants were wealthier than Catholics, therefore they're more likely to become educated and therefore successful. So it's this idea that, that there's um, a system of inequality, Catholics are more wealthy, and that therefore you reproduce uh, that inequality in the capitalist economy. And he claims that's not true. And he uses the, um, the fact that Protestants who do go to university study business, Catholics tend to study the liberal arts. You know, Catholics, again, to use um, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the um, uh, you know, they really believe in sort of a God-filled world. So studying the liberal arts helps you understand the God-filled world, that kind of thing. And so uh, Catholics wish to stay working in crafts, Protestants often seek out management, entrepreneurship, working in factories. Even when equal amounts of wealth lead to equal amounts of education, Protestants become Catholics, and uh, Protestants become capitalists, Catholics do not. Okay, so myth three is the pariah people's thesis, in which Protestants are like Jews, a pariah people who lived in, you know, oppressed out groups on the fringe of Catholic society, right? You know, living in, in ghettos, essentially, right? Uh, technically ghettos, not not pejorative, just technically. Uh, since barred from politics, military, and honorif honorific employments because of, you know, quite honestly, uh, uh, prejudice and, and racism, Jews and Protestants pour their energy into the one channel open to them, success in the capitalist economy. And Weber says that's not quite true because Protestants are more likely to be capitalist uh, than Catholics, even in Protestant countries. So it doesn't matter if a Protestant is a pariah or a minority population, even when they run the country, they're more likely to become capitalist uh, than are Catholics. And then the final argument that Weber sets aside is that Catholics are more, or the examines at least, Catholics are more ascetic uh, than Protestants. I know there's multiple ways to pronounce that word, by the way. I always use ascetic. I pronounce it loudly and proudly. It's probably wrong, but uh, that they're more ascetic, they're more self-denying. Um, you know, they engage in things like abstaining from meat, uh, fasting in, in particular days. They, they they conduct penance to pay for their sins. They have forced ritual attendance. You know, they do a lot of bowing and scraping and genuflecting and, you know, that kind of thing. As Weber said, it's a well-known phrase in Europe, Protestants eat well while Catholics sleep well, right? That the Catholic conscience is clear because you get your uh, the state of grace wiped away. Uh, Catholic asceticism limits the pursuit of wealth wealth, comfort, and luxury. The Protestants do that, but they do get this. Uh, they Anyway, this is negated by the fact that Protestants are much, much more ascetic, says Weber, than Catholics, but in a different direction. Catholic asceticism is directed towards the other world. In other words, when a Catholic self-denies or engages in, 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 in harmful conduct, you know, beating themselves, whipping, flagellation, that kind of thing, it's directed at the spirit world. Uh, trying to save the soul, trying to go to heaven instead of hell and reduce the time in purgatory. When Protestants engage in ascetic conduct, it's almost always directed at business, practical conduct, and profit. So Catholics are ascetic in uh, time off, not at work, right? Uh, so 
they avoid work. They're not ascetic at work. They're ascetic in, again, their consumption practices and in what they do during Lent and, and so on. Protestants are actually ascetic at work and at the rest of everyday life. Okay, so they are ascetic in the world, in the way that they actually work in the world. So Weber's Protestant ethic and spirit of capitalism begins with this point. So you negate everything else, and he says, here's where we need to look. We need to look at ascetic Protestantism and why on earth it developed this, this ascetic approach, um, self-denying approach, right? Pleasure-denying approach uh, to everyday life in, in modern capitalism. All right, so let's jump into, uh, into chapter uh, two. Now, this is an interesting chapter. Weber writes this book kind of inverted in an inverted manner, and this chapter is put together in an inverted manner. So it's about the spirit of capitalism, but he, he doesn't give you a provisional definition of what it is until about page 64. There's a little, there's a little one earlier. Um, but let's sort of begin at the end and then work back to the beginning. So, in other words, he argues all chapter about what the spirit of capitalism actually is or how he wants you to think about it, and then it's only at the end that he gives it to you. So here's what it is. The spirit of capitalism, again, think of it as a ghost, right, that possesses people, right? The ghost, ooh, the spirit of capitalism possessing people, right? The spirit, And then once you're possessed by that spirit, you act in accordance with it. So if you've seen any of the great horror films, you know, like, um, uh, you know, the invasion of the body snatches or something, right? Or, 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 you know, you get possessed by an alien or you get possessed by a, a zombie or, you, you know, you get bit or something and then you get taken over by them, you act like them, that kind of thing. So if you get bit by the spirit of capitalism, you're going to act like a capitalist. So this is an attitude which seeks profit rationally and systematically through ethical, scrupulous, ascetic work and a calling. So all of these words wind up being really important, especially calling. So again, Marx has a very different view of what a capitalist is. Weber views capitalism, especially this version of capitalism, the essential spirit of capitalism, is one that is ethical, not in, in scrupulous, right? You have scruples, you have um, you have moral moral um, um, a, co a moral code that you live by, and that you won't violate that moral code in pursuit of profit. You're going to pursue profit ethically, right? You're not going to cheat people. You're not going to violate your code or the code of other people. And you're going to work hard without pleasure, right? In a calling that you think was um, was determined for you by God and that you treat with the same kind of seriousness that a Catholic would treat, say, a monastery, right? Okay. So the spirit of, uh, of capitalism, if you get infected by it, you go out and try to make money, all right? So, so whatever you are, if you're someone who enjoys watching Netflix and eating Doritos, that gets lost and you become somebody who rationally and systematically pursues profit ethically, scrupulously, and ascetically in a calling, right? You don't engage in side bets and, and drug deals on this side. Uh-uh. You get a calling, you get a profession, and you work within your profession. You start a business and you work within that business ethically, scrupulously, and self and in a self-denying way, all right? That is Weber's notion of the spirit of capitalism. So it's not an unethical world. It's not in a world of cheating or of exploitation. It's really a world, um, at least early on, where um, where people, uh, again, are, are ethical, right? It's, it's the place of ethical conduct. So page 79 uh, or 69, um, calculating it, daring, temperate and reliable, shrewd and completely devoted to their business with strictly bourgeois opinions and principles. Another, this is part of the description of a person with the spirit of capitalism, all right? Um, you have a certain ascetic tendency, a sort of modesty, which is essentially more honest than the reserve, which Ben Franklin he talks about. Uh, so, so again, you're very, very, very modest, unassuming, but honest and ascetic. He gets nothing out of his wealth for himself except the irrational sense of having done his job well. Again, like uh, if you're a good capitalist possessed by the spirit of capitalism, you're not making money to enjoy. You're making profit, which is simply calculated on a spreadsheet, right? You're doing that not for any, like you're not going to sit back and enjoy it. You just see your score and you take that score to reference your soul or at least to reference your, your value in the world in some way and you have a job well done. So there's no actual tangible physical enjoyment. You don't have any even an image of being successful. It's really a symbolic code that gives you a sense of having a job well done. So page 73, in the spirit of capitalism, money making then is an end in itself to which people are bound as a calling, as a religious calling, literally called by God, you know, to come and do this, this job. More on that in chapter three, which is really all about the calling.
Okay, back to chapter two. Um, this quote from uh, from Ferdinand Kernberger, who was sort of making fun of Ben Franklin, uh, that people that are possessed by the spirit of capitalism make tallow out of cattle, right? Like, you know, uh, they render cattle to make, you know, the fat that makes soap. They make tallow out of cattle or, you know, uh, tallow candles and money out of men. So you take, <laughs> you cut apart a cow, you boil it, you get tallow. You take human beings, you cut them apart, you throw them into a factory somewhere and you get money. So you make money out of men. Sex is term, but the sentiment is right on. Okay, so that's the spirit of capitalism. So it is treated as an ethical duty, an ethos. It's actually, again, a kind of a code of conduct. So you're not just like, again, I don't think Donald Trump fits well, the, uh, the idea of the spirit of capitalism at all in Weber's terms. It's, you, you pursue money as an ethical duty, as a calling. Okay, so the spirit of capitalism is distinct from utilitarianism, which means doing things or appearing to do them because they are useful to the individual. Um, yeah, bec uh, all right, so that's not it. Um, I'm going to skip that. Um, and then, yeah, then the ethical qualities of the spirit of capitalism are really important to him. Um, page 53, the, you know, the, 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 uh, the center of this ethic is earning more and more and more money combined with a strict avoidance of all spontaneous enjoyment of life. Money making is an end in itself. So there it is. You sort of chain yourself to this um, um, task of perpetual money making. More and more, there's never enough and you can never enjoy it, right? So, you, so your life is one where you're making money, more and more and more money, but you can't enjoy any of it. No spontaneous enjoyment of life. You are ascetic. You have essentially bound yourself to a code of conduct that forbids you from having spontaneous enjoyment. Money making is the only end. So again, in the spirit of capitalism, there's no reference to God. You'll notice this, right? It's a completely secular uh, uh, ethic. And money-making is an end in itself. It is literally a sacred end. Okay? Everything in life is about pursuing profit as a sacred end. It is the thing set apart. The spirit of capitalism in many ways absolutely irrational. Again, like from any other standpoint, this is a crazy way to live, right? From my particular standpoint, it's kind of a crazy way to live. Um, you know, uh, the enjoyment of life is important, right? And the, the spirit of capitalism forbids that. So page 53 to 54, the earning of mummies, money, so long as it is done legally, is the result in the expression of virtue and proficiency in a calling. Again, that's really going to be important. This virtue and proficiency are the real alpha and omega of Franklin's ethics. So he uses Ben Franklin here. So then he sets up chapter 3 and 4 on page 54, that the duty in a calling is the fundamental quality of the spirit of capitalism. So the idea is, is to have a division of labor in society, and people are called by God, essentially, or by the big other, without the name God attached to it, uh, to one of these uh, uh, positions in the division of labor. Uh, really, generally, it fits your tastes and talents. That's what I always tell students is the, sort of the key, tastes and talents. That, you, that, that the, the task is to your taste. You don't mind doing it too much, and you're really talented at it. So it's the thing that you can do better than anyone else without even trying or at least it's the thing you can do best um, without trying too much, right? So page 56, the spirit of capitalism had to fight its way to supremacy against a whole world of hostile forces. Moderns applaud behavior consistent with the spirit of capitalism, but traditional people uh, judge it the lowest sort of avarice, right? So to him, the key, the big thing, the biggest barrier to the spirit of, of, of capitalism is the spirit of traditionalism. It's on page 59 and what he calls the traditional economic ethic. So um, again, I think I told you it's at the end of the book where he quotes um, uh, uh, Count Zinzendorf uh, with, with the famous line that, uh, yeah, that, you're, that if you work in order to live your traditional Right, and if you live in order to work, you have, you're embedded with the spirit of capitalism. And so, if you are working in order to live, you have values that you're willing to die for, and you won't give up those values for money making. With the spirit of cap, that's the spirit of traditionalism. You have traditional values, and you'll die holding on to those things. In the spirit of capitalism, those values don't matter, and you will sacrifice those values in order to increase value, in order to increase money, right, profit. So traditionalism and the world of values, right, the traditional world of values is the strongest barrier to the adoption of the spirit of capitalism. 
So he's going to try to figure out why that is, okay? So other spirits such as the unholy lust for money, the spirit of the miser, the spirit of the gambler, all of those things are not, uh, uh, are not, um, uh, are not the uh, spirit of capitalism, right? So page, uh, yeah, footnote 23, page 264, the quote from Zinzendorf, traditional economic ethic, work to live, spirit of capitalism, live to work. Best way to think about this in a short term way. Okay, so chapter two um, as he's en route to telling us about the spirit of capitalism, he includes all these uh, quotations from uh, Ferdinand Kernberger, uh, who's a German who's writing about Ben Franklin, essentially, right? So here's Ben Franklin, good old modest uh, Ben Franklin, who, if you know anything about him, is a kind of Quaker Calvinist hybrid, right? So some of these uh, phrases from Franklin are worth looking at. Um, remember that time is money. He that can earn 10 shillings a day by his labor and goes abroad or sits idle one half of that day, though he spends but sixpence during his diversion or idleness, ought not to reckon that his only expense. He has really spent or reckon thrown away five shillings besides. Credit is money. So this idea that time is money really comes up. And so if, you, if, you, if you're lazy and you fail to work today, you haven't just foregone the wages you could have earned today, but you're foregoing the interest or the earnings that you could have had on the savings that you would have put put away today, right? Uh, money has has the prolific generating nature. Money can beget money, and its offspring can beget much more. He that killeth a breeding sow destroys all her offspring to the thousandth generation. If you murder a crown or a dollar, uh, you destroy all that it might have produced, even scores of dollars or pounds. Uh, so the good paymaster is lord of another man's purse. The most trifling actions that affect a man's credit uh, are to be regarded. You got to keep an eye on that. Um, yeah, he that idly loses five shillings worth of time loses five shillings and might as prudently throw five uh, shillings into the sea. Uh, yeah, so it's that kind of thing. Is that it's just that you got to constantly pay attention. And again, the crucial line there is they make tallow out of cattle and money out of men. Right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's an ethic, an ethic of 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 of, uh, of money making an ethic of money making okay so here's a picture of ben franklin uh, uh working away being seen a uh, working yeah so here it is so the spirit of traditionalism traditional economic ethics again it is uh work to live and to honor values a valued life right that working shouldn't be the focus of life money making should be the focus of life it really should be uh, embedded within, um, uh, you know, a, a system of values. It's really working and money making for their life and that you stop working when you can afford the valued life, right? Because you want to live the valued life. So working is tied to the rest of life. It's not an end in itself. So in the traditional economic, work is not an end. Profit is not an end. Instead, it's a means to an end. And the larger end is values, right? The valued, you know, traditional, a uh, valued way of life, right? So there it is. So in the world, in this world, then, if you uh, if you make the means the end, if you make money making your god or money making your ultimate value, this is a sin known as greed or avarice, right? And you often get scorned, right? But in in walled towns, the the incubators of capitalism, you get a positive attitude towards money making. Um, and then the greedy who acquired money are became viewed as potentially redeemable, if not outright saintly. The cold calculating quality of the capitalist thinking is reflecting the faces and actions of those who you're going to see in this following series of images. So here's an image of one of these walled towns of Northern Europe, sort of a, a cartoon from the early 20th century. But I really like this idea that the walled towns are surrounded by a defensive wall. Uh, that means that they don't have lords and ladies and aristocrats and warriors walking around with long hair and swords. Instead, the town is its own defensive structure. So it means that the people who work in the town, there's the church at the center, the people who work in the town are also its, its defense system, right? So you stand on the wall and fight and defend. I really like this image here, right? So anyone who tries to attack the town, the members of the town uh, defend. So so those who have ascendancy and leadership in business generally wind up having ascendancy and leadership in, in these uh, kind of communitarian uh, uh, locations, right? So capitalism sort of emerges in this place, these walled towns that have a kind of socialist or communist quality to them. It's really interesting. 
Money making is something that remains individualistic, but the town defense and the state and the government and so on have a very collectivist quality to them. You can't get away from other people. You're part of all of that. So here's an image. I think this is from Peter Bruegel. Um, so this is an image of one of the seven deadly sins, avarice. So you see here, you know, uh, money making being depicted as this horrible uh, end. You know, um, if you know anything about Dante, the greedy uh, don't fare well in hell, um, right? So it's one of the deadly sins. Money making is a deadly sin, okay? And here's another image of money making as a deadly sin. So this is the death of the, um, yeah, uh, Hieronymus Bosch's uh, Death in the Miser from 1490. So the miser is about to die. Um, you've got kind of this war going on of, of uh, devil death coming, uh, demons taking the stuff, uh, de another demon ready to take his soul, and, uh, and then the possibility of salvation with the light shining in, and this little angel saying, no, stop. So there's kind of a war going on for this man's soul, but clearly the money-making, the miser, right? The wealth is the thing that is blocking him, right? It maybe it was his God. Okay, the fate of the rich man's soul is certainly uncertain. This is George Gies, um, uh, Gies up, right? Uh, Hans Holbein um, painted uh, merchant pictures. Uh, Mitch, <laughs> this is where Hans Holbein painted merchant uh, portraits. Wealthy people had money and they got their portraits painted. And so there was this kind of this realism in German painting. But I just love the hard, steely eye of the merchant, right? Staring you, calculating, writing things down but staring at you hard, right? Judging your character. Not a happy, well-to-do guy, right? So there it is. The new man, uh, right? Who makes tallow out of cattle and money out of men. And then, you know, like St. Peter, and through cover to this shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not in the way. Kind of like that. Here's here's Jan Gossert. Um, uh, yeah, portrait of a merchant here. Uh, so another merchant with that hard... Uh, steely gaze, calculating, right? Keeping records, uh, uh, double entry bookkeeping. All right. Um, I'm probably going to skip that. Um, skip this as well. Yeah. Okay. So we've seen enough of those images. We'll come back to this later if we come back at all to it. Okay. All right. Now, before we get into this, I want you to understand what tradition actually is. So we did it last time that in a traditional society, you believe in spirits and you believe that the spirits are everywhere in the world and have uh, um, impact upon the world and that the only way to control spirits is through magic. Okay. And so a priest in a medieval uh, uh, Catholic congregation or church uh, functioned as a magician often, right? Transforming bread into the body of Christ, but healing the sick. Um, you know, in my church when I was a boy, uh, you know, we had the the uh, the Saint Blaise blessing of the throat with two candles, right? At uh, uh, to make sure you didn't get sick, think get COVID or something, right? Um, but there was all kinds of magic sacraments that were performed by the church and magic functions, and and uh, this is an image of an exorcism. So, you know, if you're traditional, you believe that spirits walk the earth, they can get inside of you, they can possess you. The spirit of capitalism is one of those things that possesses you. You can get an evil spirit that possesses you as well. But to live in a traditional world where you believe in a mundane God and where you're engaged in sacrifice to try to keep the evil forces at bay or sacrifice to keep the God protecting you against the spirits that are evil, right? The basic idea is that the traditional world is one that is full of spirits, whether you can see them or not. Good, evil, uh, almost doesn't matter. Here's a, uh, I, I love this, this is a, a manuscript, illuminated manuscript from I think the 14th century, again, very early. And here's this little demon whispering in the ear of a king. I just love this, this image. But you can't see the demon, but you can sense the, uh, you know, that there's some sort of force going on in the world. And, uh, and so, yeah, so there's often a, a war of spiritual forces, especially in, in medieval Catholicism. You have the sacred pure and the sacred impure fighting. We don't really care about the pure and impure thing right now. I just want to get a sense of this. In traditional worlds with mundane gods, mundane spiritual uh, uh, powers, spirits are everywhere in the world. Um, this is an image. I, I like this one. Um, it's actually Gulliver's Travels, but I may let's come, <laughs> let's come. Well, let's use it right now. What the heck? So, um, 
So babe, so if 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 you know anything about about um, about Swift's book, right? There's there's four uh, sections to the book. The first part where Gulliver goes on his travels, he winds up in Lilliput, and the Lilliputians are these tiny little people about six inches tall who take Gulliver. Remember and famously. Um, they get mad at him because I think he, he urinates on a fire in town. He does all kinds of things. He's a, he's a monster to them. Anyway, they, they, uh, uh, you know, they wind up, uh, tying him down. Remember the famous scene? It's been reproduced. It's satires. Love it. Right. Where, uh, Gulliver is tied down by the Lilliputians. So if you think of the Lilliputians as sort of spirit beings that are permeating the world, we don't see them normally. They're invisible to us. We're the size of Gulliver. But we're nevertheless afraid of them, and they can seek vengeance upon us and therefore tie us down. So I like what happens to Gulliver in Gulliver's Travels, where he winds up um, disregarding this. He wasn't taking the little people seriously. You know, they get they have an army that goes against him and things. And um, uh, and in the end, those in you know somewhat inconsequential, invisible beings nevertheless had the capacity to uh, uh, to prevent him from acting with freedom. So Weber argues that in a traditional society, the world is full of spirits, demons, and requires magic to manipulate it. And because of that, you dare not change uh, the ritual order. So you dare not change the way you do things. You dare not change the timing of how you do it. You dare not change the way you eat. You dare not change the way that marriages are performed, that sex is performed, that uh, money making is performed, uh, that, that that work is done, right? You don't change these things because um, the rituals are in place to keep the evil spiritual forces at bay or away and to augment or keep the favor of the positive spiritual forces. So, you know, Weber says, again, you're bound hand and foot um, in a traditional society by these spiritual forces, and that is what you have here. So the world of magic is a world of imminent spirit and imminent spiritual forces, uh, magical forces, mana, that, that must be dealt with and that that limits. You simply can't treat the means of life, the ways of life as profane things that can be augmented or done away with or performed however you want to do them, right? You can't reconstruct everyday life in a rational way because you must uh, um, maintain the ritual order. So like Goffman's book, I, I just put up a, a video of Goffman's book, Interaction Ritual, the other day. You know, in these traditional societies, everyday life is ritualistic, right? And every interaction is is essentially an interaction ritual, right? The whole world is sacred and you don't change anything. So you get this hyper-conservative world. Remember, in Weber's work, his his comparative study of world religions, he thought that India was probably the culture that had most completely uh, limited um, um, you know, the, um, um, yeah, that it most completely limited the, um, the movement, uh, that, 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 that tradition was most seriously locked down by the system of the transmigration of souls that was part of Hinduism. Okay. So here's, uh, so again, to be in a traditional society of magic, Christianity prior to the Protestant Reformation, is to believe in um, in the mystical union, mysticism, where you and God or you and Jesus uh, can can or you and, and some other spiritual force can have uh, intercourse, not sexual necessarily, although that's possible too. That uh, the bride of Christ was one of the primary ways that saints and nuns thought of themselves. Again. Uh, leave that aside but 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 that you can have um uh again uh interaction you can sense and feel and be close to um uh personified spiritual beings like jesus okay so this is catherine of siena i actually went and saw her um um looks pretty good yeah she, her body is relatively incorrupt and uh so yeah so this is uh catherine of siena a devotional image showing her exchanging her heart for the sacred heart of Jesus, right? So Jesus gives her his heart. She rips hers out and gives it to him. Kind of a bloody image. I'm sure it didn't happen in the real. I'm sure it was just an imagination. But nevertheless, this is mysticism, right? Catholics are full of this. And medieval Catholics in particular had this sense that that spiritual forces are never far away. You know, the Virgin Mary may appear at any moment. Jesus can touch your life, that kind of thing. And prayer and devotions are often aimed at bringing about something like a mystical moment, a mystical union with spiritual forces. Again, Catholic saints full of mysticism. Uh, this is um, St. Francis, right? 
um, who um, he, you know has the stigmata. So here he is receiving the stigmata. You have an angel coming down, apparently uh, helping to hold him still while uh, you know an archangel or someone else is shooting in uh, the stigmata. The, ident the mystical identification with Jesus was so strong with Saint Francis that he developed the uh, uh, you know the, the the nail holes in the hand uh, spontaneously erupted. Um, yeah, here, here's another one of, of the devotion to the side wound. Uh, this is important to Count Zinzendorf that Weber quotes. Um, yeah, that the side wound of Jesus um, became uh, viewed as a kind of quasi-womb, a womb-like thing, uh, a place where you could go and, and abide with Jesus, uh, as the famous song says. Um, or you can actually lick the wound of Jesus. There's a whole bunch of, of, uh, of women, in particular women, um, uh, mystics and women uh, saints who were wound lickers, right? Uh, Jacques Lacan writes about them in in uh, in one of his lectures. So at any rate, mystical union with Jesus to such an extent that you fantasize that you're licking Jesus's wound. Again, spiritual forces are everywhere. It's an image of of sacrifice. This is actually the sacrifice to uh, Moloch. Uh, you know, William Blake sometimes can really capture things. But if you want to get a sense of the world full of spiritual beings, uh, man, Blake does a good job of this. It just seems like his actual, uh, uh, the figures that he paints um, and the spiritual beings that he paints are so identical, right? They shade off into each other. So uh, this is a child sacrifice uh, to feed a god. So here's an image of... of um, Inside one of these, well, I actually I don't want to show that one. That's a little a little extreme. We won't do that one now. We may come back to that. I may edit that before I show that to you. Um, okay. So um, all right. So there we have chapter. Uh, uh, we're up through chapter two. So with that, we shall stop.